Yeah, exactly. Uh, first we'll introduce ourselves. Uh, hello, my name is Claire. I'm a third year CSD. Uh, I ski fast, draw at a medium speed, and game very slow. Uh, and the reason why I say I just like dairy free cheese is because that's the only cheese the Whole Foods in Seattle had, and it was the worst thing I've ever eaten. I want to forget that it exists. <laughs> All right, and I realize we're standing on the wrong side of the slide, but it's fine. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Prem Kumar, uh, Prem for short. Um, I'm a big fan of linguistics, fonts, Mario Kart, and I don't like bananas. Fun fact, I was gaslit for like 10 years into believing that you couldn't be allergic to bananas, but apparently I am. <laughs> but yeah. Welcome to DAB. So, digital design. Basically, in this year, you're going to be learning about how we d um, design circuits that perform tasks at the hardware level. But these aren't really the kind of circuits that you would see in, say, ECE 10 or ECE 100 or something like that. Digital circuits are more so like they're circuits, but instead of using analog components like resistors, capacitors, etc., that take like voltages and deal with a range of possible values. Digital circuits have in values of either one or zero. They're either, your wires are either high or they're low, and that's it. So these digital circuits are everywhere in the world of computing, and they perform a variety of tasks, including but not limited to microcontrollers, CPUs, graphics cards. So if you've ever been a part of another IEEE project, like MicroMouse, for example, you would have used a microcontroller and various, like, any, basically any component you had that was like a little black box with pins on the outside was probably some sort of a digital circuit. In DAV, you're going to learn how to build a digital circuit of your own by working towards one of two final projects. In the first track, we have the digital audio visualizer. This is the original DAV, so to speak. It was founded like four or five years ago by some very intelligent dude with an SPI idea. And basically what it is is you connect a microphone and a VGA display to your FPGA, and the end result is a little system that can read audio input from your microphone, process it using some signal processing techniques called the fast Fourier transform, and present a little pretty graph on this display. As you can see here, we have a couple of different DAVs with rainbows, and um, just like, they look really cool. If you're feeling adventurous, of course, we will encourage you during the course of your time working on Digital Audio Visualizer to add various features of your own in the signal processing space. The other track we have, which was founded last year by our very own Tim and Sadat, was the DDAV, the Digital Design Architecture <laughs> Verification. That's what we named the project after. Um, for, because it's a little bit more generic, but basically what it is is you're going to design a game at the hardware level. And you're going to interface with things like game controllers, uh, perhaps like a buzzer, if you will, um, various types of little like, displays and outputs, and um, a, also a VGA screen. And you're going to basically have a game that you can play entirely designed in a digital circuit. So you can make this game as simple or as advanced as you like. In the past, we've had Tetris, Pong, uh, what else we got? Uh, uh, piano, tiles piano tiles. So yeah, there's a lot of things you can do with digital design, digital circuits. And in DAV, it's our goal as leads to ensure that you know your options and that you get to create the coolest capstone possible. So during the year, uh, basically during fall and winter, we're going to have five lectures, all covering more theoretical conceptual topics that will prepare you to build your capstone and equip you with knowledge that you can apply both to actually like build your capstone and also just like in industry and interviews and things like that. Today's lecture, um, which is not really much of a lecture, it's more so like a high level overview and uh, speedrun is combinational logic, where it's basically just like the basic logic gates and some introductory components that you can make using these logic gates. The next lecture that we're going to have is on sequential logic, which is to say, what if once you make a combinational circuit with gates and multiplexers and whatever, what if, what if you wanted to actually like retain past inputs and operate on more than just the current inputs and outputs? So that's sequential logic. And then we're going to sort of diverge a little bit from the like hardware space. We're going to talk about the fundamentals of signal processing. If you're in 102 right now, you will basically be learning like sort of a um, condensed version and then also a slightly expanded version of the content in 102, mo mostly centered around the fast Fourier transform. Then in winter, we're going to have two lectures. The first one will be on serial communication, which is to say, how do you have a device like an FPGA communicate with 
a, a peripheral that is not like directly built into the FPGA. So things like nunchucks, NES controllers, uh, the GameCube bongo drums, all of these are fair game, and all of these have been used in the past to make various things in dev. And then finally, we're going to um, kind of tie it all off by teaching you a, sort of a more specialized application of serial communication, which is the VGA protocol, which is going to be how you can actually take your DAV and like whatever you have on your FPGA and display the results on screen. So additionally, we will have five workshops in which we're going to sort of teach you the more hands-on stuff that will actually enable you to build these things, because theory only takes us so far. Um, so next week, next Tuesday, actually, at the same time, we're going to have the very first workshop, which is on Cordis, Questa, and Verilog, which is to say these are like the tools that we'll be using to actually design our digital circuits. Next, we're going to have a workshop. The rest of our workshops will be in winter and spring. So in winter, we'll have the workshop on different communications protocols. So like we'll teach you the basics, like I squared C and some others, but in the event that you want to do something a little bit more fancy, we want to enable you guys um, with the tools and techniques to actually be able to approach using a controller that probably you've never used before, or even we've never used before. So rather than kind of confining you to a basic set of like options that you have for peripherals, we want to teach you the overarching techniques that will allow you to just approach any new controller that you might, or a peripheral that you might want to use. Next, we're going to teach you about microphones, which will be a fairly uh, straightforward workshop in which you guys actually get an analog microphone and connect it to your FPGA and learn how to read its uh, input and convert them to a format that your FPGA can actually understand. Finally, in spring, we will have two workshops on the more advanced stuff, which is to say the first one will be on advanced graphics techniques, so things like basically um, how you can make your game look a little bit fancier on that VGA screen. And then finally, we'll have a workshop on fancy digital audio visualizer features, which are going to be more sort of signal processing um, techniques that you can do to basically make your DAV cooler. So our expectations of DAV members are all in the syllabus, which is linked here. It's all, it was also linked in the project application, and we'll be putting it in Discord, which, by the way, you guys should join. More on that later. But um, yeah, so all of our expectations of DAV members will be in the syllabus, and the syllabus could change, but like if anything significant about it changes, we will let you guys know. We believe that communication is really important, and we want to make sure that as much as we're um, providing for you, we want to make sure that you guys are able to approach us and reach us, and if you need any help, that we're always there for you. So if you're struggling or have team issues or just literally anything DAB related or otherwise, make sure you reach out to us and let us know so we can best, us, best assist you. Okay, now on to the next your regularly scheduled content. Uh, we're going to start with an overview of what, why we're using an FPGA, what even is an FPGA, um, and more on that. So in order to tell you about what an FPGA is, um, let's talk about what it is not. So one common thing you might have heard of before is a CPU, which is in all of your computers, and it can do a lot of different things. But the one that you may not have heard of before is an ASIC, which is a chip that is very specialized. It can do only one task, and it can do it very well. Uh, it's, you had one job, but it can actually do one job. And, uh, so essentially, the process for getting an ASIC is very long, time, time consuming, and costly. So you have to design it yourself, um, whether that's specifying the behaviors of it, then you have to send that to a factory that can actually fabricate it for you, and then you get it back, um, which takes quite a while, and you spend a lot of money, but uh-oh, uh, your ASIC doesn't work. So all of that money has been wasted. Now, that kind of sucks, and if that was the only option for you, and I feel like uh, the digital design world would not have gotten this far. Is the world really this unfair? Fortunately, the answer is no. F time G to the rescue. I just want to shout that out. Um, yeah, so this is the FPGA project. And why are we using it? Because specifically, they're designed to be configurable. That way, you don't have to spend a lot of money sending a design out and get it back. That wouldn't be sustainable for this project. Uh, basically, we're too poor. Fabricating is expensive. And if this project involved any kind of transistor level manipulation, I would not have done it. So modeling on FPGA is much easier and faster. 
Now, you might have heard that we'll also be using a coding language called Verilog, and that's just not because Ukraine and I are trying to convert all of you to become CS majors, but it's because Verilog is a different kind of coding language. Uh, specifically, the name is a hardware description language. We need to get it Okay, so how does Verilog actually work? There's actually two kinds of instruction. One is, I believe, structural, and the other is behavioral. What that means is structural behaviors are bitwise operations, for example, maybe array indexing, things that visual logic can just do purely through like gates, for example. Uh, behavioral is what you would do in, for example, CS32 or something, where you write like, uh, and if this, then that, or like for loops. That is behavioral because it takes the behavior you specify and it turns it into logic gates. So once you hit synthesize, the bear log will figure out how to turn your code into one that can be done purely through your logic gates. And finally, what's really cool is that the FPGA will actually change or reprogram to model the behavior that you specified. So that's how it connects down to the hardware level. But what does all of that really mean? What does it look like under the surface? So essentially, the FPGA has a bunch of lookup tables. So you will feed it your inputs, and it will have a matching pattern in this table, and it will be able to generate the output that you want. So that's how it's able to simulate any sort of combination of gates, for example. Um, but what if we want more than just your basic combinational logic? then you need to create slices. So lookup tables are actually one of the smallest subunits in the FPGA. So in order for it to do more with it, we need to combine it with other things. So as you can see here, we've drawn a slice for you that's comprised of a lookup table, a register, and multiplexers. And these all can be grouped in blocks <coughs> called slices. Now, the reason why they're formatted like that is because we talked about how when you uh, run your program in Verilog, you'll actually reprogram the FPGA. And how does that actually work? It takes all of these separate slices <coughs> and uh, reroutes them to create what's necessary for your program. So when we talk about Cordis later, and you have to click the button that says place and route, that's actually what it's doing. It's rearranging all of these slices so that it can run your program. That's pretty cool of you. Before we continue, are there any questions so far? So there's enough like logic gates and paths for you to like do like anything pretty much. It wouldn't be routing. There are some very large FPGAs, and in fact, the FPGAs that you'll be using in DAP have fifty thousand logic blocks. And each of those logic blocks has like, or I think a logic block is a slice. So each of those will have like, you know, some sort of lookup table which has a variety of different inputs that it can match to outputs, and of, like the memory and the all the routing resources necessary to connect these <coughs> together. Of course, the flip side is that since basically what this um, synthesis process is doing is it's taking your circuit and trying to sort of it's almost like putting the pieces of the puzzle together and trying to like fit it onto your FPGA. So as a result, if you use more than like, you know, a fifth of what your FPGA has to offer, it's going to take an absurdly long time. And in fact, our Tetris project took like, what was it, 17 minutes? 20, to, uh, yeah, around 20 minutes to synthesize onto our FPGA at the very end. So it takes a long time if you are like really pushing the limits of your FPGA, but your FPGA does have the ability to do a lot of things. I hope that answered your question. Uh, so the FPGA is ever physically wrapped? Um. That's a great question, and I actually have no idea. My guess yeah. is that yes, they would after a very long time, but I can look at, I can look that up and find out for you. How is an FPGA turning the Verilog into like logic gates different from like a compiler? So yeah, so that will actually be coming up next. But what essentially it does is you know how you have your if then else uh, format. I'm going to use that as an example. Then what the F the Verilog will actually do is turn that into a multiplexer, and this will actually cause some like other things you need to look out for. 
such as you need to make sure every single path is defined so it can select from it, um, but it will translate like, your code into like, digital logic blocks. Yeah. Else. There's just a bunch of like Ver um, Verilog syntax constructs that kind of map to specific components in digital circuits, and your synthesis tool, which is Quartus in our case, will ensure that when you write your Verilog, it has the ability to actually take the code that you wrote and convert them into these, these um, smaller digital blocks and put them on your FPGA. And if there isn't, it'll throw some sort of synthesis error. Did I answer your question? Any other questions? Um, so why do we care about the difference between structural and behavioral like So in all honesty, we probably will not be doing very much structural Verilog at all. Uh, we just brought it up because we think it's important to understand the difference between what like at your what you would be doing if you just wrote bitwise operations versus what you'd be doing if you wrote something like if this wire then that or etc. Basically, you need to understand that Verilog has a lot of abstractions in the form of these behavioral constructs that you can use to basically represent various types of digital circuits without having to literally draw the gates out like you might in an M16 class. Adrian. So is it the case then that behavioral that this behavioral like code can be used in place of the structural code? Yes. Okay. You will for the like for the most part in DAB you will be basically always writing behavioral Verilog. Okay. In a class like 152B, the Verilog capstone, you may be expected to write structural um, Verilog. In fact, that was our first lab for that class. You believe to write structural Verilog to design an ALU, an arithmetic logic unit, okay. which we'll talk about more later. But yeah, it's just a mental exercise kind of thing. How does an FPGA like read out those logicals to each other in the code center? Yeah, so when you specify your code, you remember how we said that the logic gates had, or like the slices had like lookup tables um, that can simulate combinational code. And so when you draw out the digital circuit and it has all that combinational logic, um, you can kind of imagine that those are the connections that you probably need that would be rerouted to to make your function. Yeah, and in addition, each like in between all the slices, like if you go back to the diagram we had on the slices, in between like our slices are little um, subunits that basically handle routing different slices to each other. So you can make like slices that take certain inputs and perform certain actions, and you can route them to other slices, and in this way you can create some really complicated sort of um, behaviors. Sorry, sorry, wait, can you explain the difference between the structural and behavioral? Yeah, so like, ha have you taken M16? Uh, no. Okay, so in uh, M16, uh, you sometimes, and depending on the professor, they might ask you to like draw a circuit, like say draw an adder by draw, drawing out like the physical AND gates and the OR gates and the XORs or whatever. That like, if you were to basically translate that work like gate by gate into your Verilog by using the bitwise operations, that would be structural Verilog. If instead, to make an adder, you just use the plus operator in Verilog, that would be behavioral, where instead of like describing the structure of your sort of the structure of your uh, circuit, you're describing the behavior that you want it to achieve, and Verilog figures out how to actually convert that into the ands and ors of the other gates that it needs in the FPGA. Thank you. So would it be correct to say that behavioral programming ultimately breaks down into structural programming, it's just you're not doing the structural yeah. part? Yeah, I think that's fair. Any more? Cool. Wonderful. All right, so. Now we're gonna talk about the specific FPGAs that DAV uses, the FPGA, if you will. So, this is the Terasic, or yeah, Altera Max 10, 10, N50, DAF484C7G FPGA on a Terasic DE10 Lite. You don't need to remember all that, you just need to remember this part. And don't worry, by the end of DAV, you probably will. So, on these FPGAs, which have like, I don't know, 50,000 logic blocks, as I said earlier, a ton of resources, basically, there are a variety of different ways that you can connect these FPGAs to other peripherals. So for example, at the top we have uh, GPIO pins, a VGA port over there for your display, uh, some buttons, LEDs, switches, and uh, seven second displays. We'll talk about all of those in a little bit more detail now. So first, the actual FPGA itself is just this large black square in the middle. This is like the actual, you know, this is what has all of our logic blocks in it. Um, it's gonna be the sort of brain of the operation. By the end of this year, from just having to type this into Quartus every time you create a new project, you'll probably have this number memorized. Next, um, probably the most important part in terms of DAV is the GPIO pins. 
So at the very top, you can see a bunch of male and female uh, pins that basically will allow you to, to connect jumper wires um, and therefore connect like you know uh, other components. So a buzzer or perhaps a, like an NES controller or even nunchuck. We have breakout boards for various types of peripherals, and you will be using breadboards to connect those to the pins on this FPGA. Next, we have some switches and LEDs. These are fairly straightforward. The LEDs are basically just um, output pins on the FPGA. So when you synthesize your digital circuit, you will have the opportunity to tell your um, synthesis tool, Portis, you'll be able to tell it, I want this output of my circuit to map to this particular LED. And then in, when your circuit's actually running on the FPGA, whenever that particular output goes high, your LED will turn on. And whenever it's <coughs> low, the LED will turn off. These are, of course, um, like combinationally driven, which means that when your output value changes, your LED will also instantly reflect that because it's a digital circuit. Similarly, we have switches, which are inputs to your circuit that you can assign to the inputs of your, um, your, your top level module, which basically means that if you ever want to basically create a circuit that uses the switches to do something, perform some computation, and then display the results on the LED, you can. You would just, when you're writing your module, you don't really like, you kind of abstract that away as just saying, I have inputs of like a 10-bit number as my input and 10-bit number as my output, and those would, then you can map those to the switches and the LEDs, uh, respectively. Next, we have uh, seven segment displays, which, of course, you guys know what seven segment displays do. You can just display any number on them, provided it fits within the um, segments. Have any of you taken M152A or used another FPGA before? Okay, so if you've taken that class, you would know that the FPGAs we use in M152A are actually like a little bit more complicated in how you use your seven segment displays. In the sense that those seven segment displays require like a very specific kind of pattern that you need to supply to your pins in order to actually drive the value of these, um, these displays. On the contrary, our FPGAs are a lot nicer, and you literally just assign each segment as an independent output pin, and it's just combinationally driven, like an, almost like an LED, basically. So that makes it really easy to put up really complicated uh, like results on your 7 segment display, such as, for example, score keeping in a game. So, Next, probably the most annoying part of our FPGA are the buttons, which at first glance you'd be like, why are these annoying? They're really helpful. And frankly, they are really helpful and you'll probably use them a lot when working on your DAV projects. But here's, here's the deal. Our buttons are debounced, which makes them really easy to set up and use. And frankly, this is really nice because we'll talk about what debouncing is in the next lecture, but the moral of the story is that buttons regularly, like if they're not debounced, there's like sort of a um, little effect where if you press the button, it doesn't go low immediately. It like, the signal that it produces is kind of like a, it bounces really quickly between the two and then it settles at a um, low or whatever, like when you press it. And then when you release it, the same thing happens. Um, these buttons are debounced, which means when you press it, our circuit will interpret the button values immediately going low or high or whatever you decide to call it. On the flip side, these buttons are annoying in the sense that they're active low, which means that when you press the button, the button, like the value of the output is gonna be zero. And when you release it, the output is one, which is really annoying because a lot of times you will be expecting the value of your, you're expecting like zero to mean like an off state, which is when the button is not pressed. But in the case of our FPGA buttons, you will have to flip them. This is something really important that you should keep in mind because it has definitely caused like every single DAV team some level of heartache while working on their projects. Okay, now it's speed running time. We are going to speed run through the basics of M51A or the M16. Hopefully sure. most of you have taken Do you want to switch so you can, so I can just put Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Yeah, so we're hoping that you already know the basic gates, uh, how it works in binary, and like general basics of the way you So this will be like one step above that. So hopefully, all of you have seen multiplexers before, but it's okay if you haven't. Basically, a multiplexer, the circuit is down there, but all you need to know really is that a multiplexer is like a selector. So the most basic form, as you see over here, is the two to one multiplexer, which means that it takes one select bit and has two like, potential outputs, I guess. So for 
for example, if the select bit is zero, then whatever is connected to the zero port will go through to the output. And again, if the selector is one, then whatever comes into the one branch will go through the multiplexer and to the output. Now, we can get a little more complex with these and make a really long multiplexer. I said before that um, uh, an if, then, else statement can be translated to multiplexer. And the reason why is because if something, then you can select, use the select bit to choose that one, and then if you want to go else if, then you just use the select bit to choose like path number one, for example. And in that way, you're able to pick what branch you want through this multiplexer. And the select bits are handled in binary. So if you just have like zero, zero, one, for example, then it'll go to the one path. Um, so therefore, um, a two to the s to one multiplexer, which means it has two to the s input and one output, it will need s selection bits. So it can choose every single path. Uh, do we have any questions on multiplexers so far? Uh, can you have more than one out output? Uh, not for your multiplexer. Frankly, it wouldn't really make sense to because if you wanted more than one output, you would just have two separate multiplexers with the same inputs and select different things based on each one. And also, I wanted to add that, like Claire mentioned earlier, um, one of the restrictions about a hardware description language is that when you're describing a multiplexer behaviorally, you have to ensure that you follow some very specific guidelines as to how you define it. Namely, that every single like path through the multiplexer must be defined. So unlike in a regular programming language where you could have like, I don't know, an if and then like an, a bunch of else statements with like kind of, an, uh, kind of an arbitrary number of them with no real defined path, in a multiplexer you will always need to make like your input, your condition will always have to have an output for every single possibility. So in, for example, in this case, if we have a three bit select line in our um, if statement condition, then we will have to have eight paths for the multiplexer in order to try to synthesize combinational. Are there any other questions? So basically, the multiplexer always will have like uh, like, a two, like it, it, the amount of uh, like inputs in it. Like the amount of selectors you have. Uh, sorry. Like the amount of inputs that the multiplexer has is dependent on the amount of like, selectors. So if you have three, so it's always dependent on two different. Sides. Yeah, because you need to be able to reach every single path on the multiplexer, and so by using in binary, it's actually very compressed. So you see that that's the general rule that in order to have so many like inputs to be valid, then you need to have the select bits to be able to choose them. Yeah. We're telling you this now because we want to get you, give you guys like a solid foundation to thinking about your digital circuits. But you will find when we start doing uh, more complicated uh, like digital circuits in Verilog that. You can actually define like if statements with slightly less restricted uh, conditions, as long as and we'll teach you how to understand what those are doing. But for now, just keep in mind that this is that an if statement will typically synthesize to a multiplexer of some variety, and that the conditions um, kind of determine how many inputs and outputs should be produced. All right. Now, as Ken mentioned before, uh, an adder or an Right here is a half adder, but that is an example of how a behavioral uh, code gets translated down to a structural one. So hopefully you're familiar with the structure of a half adder. Essentially, it takes two uh, inputs that's going to add, A and B, and then it will output the sum uh, and the XOR, I believe, and then a carry, which is basically a both sum R1. So in this way, this is how you add numbers at the base level. Um, but we'll probably be dealing with much larger numbers than just one bit each, right? So in that case, we need to make sure that our adders can have the previous carry, and that's called a full adder. So now we're taking both A and B, as you remember before, and now we're also taking the carry to factor into the output. So the output of this full adder will still be, will have your sum and then your carry out, but now this carry can also factor in so you can chain these together to add however many numbers you want. Does that make sense so far? So that's what's happening when you do A plus B. And I think this is the final logic block that we're covering today, um, but this is an arithmetic uh, logic unit, or ALU, and we'll actually be having you implement one of these, I think,
Kind of. Kind of. Not like a full answer. But essentially what an AOU does is it takes two inputs, A and B, and then you give it an opcode uh, to tell it what to do. Because this AOU can actually do multiple things. It can add or subtract, or it can do a lot of cool operations. Like it can add them, it can order them, or maybe shift. But it will only know what to do if you give it the opcode to tell it what to do. And then it will output your result one. Is this similar to like the Shannon in composition or no? Because I have no idea what that oh, is. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> it's just the symbol looks the same. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't know. But also, I wanted to add that ALUs uh, tip sometimes, or honestly, typically, ALUs will have more outputs than just the like arithmetic like output. For example, a lot of them will also have like a zero line output that basically just tells you if the output is zero of um, this. It'll also have like sometimes an overflow output, which is to tell you if, as a result of performing your arithmetic operation, there was some sort of integer overflow. These are um, things I actually learned like last week in 152B. Um, yeah. But yeah. Uh, just an example, to throw in an example from M160C, uh, it's basically a The zero outputs used a lot for like comparisons and the overflow similarly just to like identify when there's some sort of uh, like error in your uh, math, math if, there's, if that's the problem you will face. Yeah, so what the AOU is inside is it's a bunch of like digital logic, so it'll take the adders that we were just talking about, the multiplexers that we were just talking about, and chips to for shifting operations. Um, and the opcode will basically be a select line to tell the circuit what to do, right? So that is actually done through uh, the multiplexer that we spoke about. Um, multiplication and division are chip operations, um, and usually with a technique called a check. Have any of you taken CS33? Yeah, so you might have heard of strength reduction before. Um, it's like a fairly standard practice, and I think there's a lot of different versions of it. It's just the general idea that like, instead of multiplying a number by four, you can shift it left by two and that'll do the same exact thing. Or like, if you want to multiply it by five, you shift it left twice to make multiply by four, and then add it to itself to make, uh, to add like, x times four plus x is five x. Just stuff like that, to, because multiplication in hardware is really complicated, but like, shifts and adds are much more trivial. Are there any further questions? Okay, well, that is it for our actual lecture content for today. Thank you guys for listening. Can I stop the recording? Uh, don't stop the recording because we have some logistics to discuss. Yeah, we're not done yet. Um, but anyway, so first of all, please don't forget to fill out the team form. Tonight is a um, ice cream social, which is intended to help you guys who don't have teams meet people and make teams. Only one person per team needs to fill out the form, but at the end, when this form is due, every single person who is in doubt needs to be accounted for. So you should either fill it out yourself or have your teammate fill it out for you. If you have two other people you want to work with already, just fill out all the blanks on the form. If you have one other person and you want us to assign you a third teammate, just fill it out with your one teammate and we'll assign you some individual person that has filled it out or themselves. If you don't have any teammates and want to be assigned, just fill it out individually. You must fill this form out by um, tomorrow night in order to get your kit and do everything, all the other fun stuff that we have planned for you. The link is here. Next, please, please, please submit your deposits. Each DAV member will need to submit a deposit of $50 that will be returned upon completion of the project. And you can Venmo UCLA IEEE the, um, with the description here. There's details on the slides. Uh, if you can't submit the deposit for whatever reason, like if it would cause you any sort of unnecessary financial burden, we really don't want that, and IEEE is meant to be a, an inclusive space for people of all financial backgrounds. So if this deposit is something that you're not able to um, s submit, that is totally fine. Please just talk to us so we can grant you a deposit accommodation on a no questions asked basis. Once you have submitted your deposit, we require proof that you did so, so please 
send um, send them this form where it'll ask you for your name and a screenshot of your deposit. If you decide to pay the deposit in cash or something that doesn't like something that's not online, you can take a screenshot of it. Just like take a selfie with Miriam and submit it to us so we know. And lastly, before you guys can get your kits, you do need to complete some safety trainings. So on worksafe.ucla.edu, there are a couple um, trainings that you need to complete before you are eligible to use our lab space and all the parts that we have to offer. Uh, these are the names of the safety trainings. The slides, will, by the way, will be posted after this lecture, so you can also just refer back here. And once you're done, please submit the certificates to this form. Our PLMs will receive it, and they will tell us whether or not you have, and if you haven't, we will hunt you down. <laughs> anyway, so next week, we have a workshop planned for you guys, uh, Tuesday, October 24th. Same time, possibly in the Shannon Room, um, possibly in the IEEE Lab, it's not entirely decided yet, but we will have the first DAB workshop where you will actually learn some Verilog, because as much as we've been able to teach you like the sort of theory and how an FPGA works, you can't really do much with that information if you don't know how to actually write code. So next week, we will teach you how to write some Verilog, some very basic constructs, and you will write a module of your own. And as an incentive to show up, if you show up, you, we will basically be completing part one of the first lab for you in that workshop. So you, if you show up, we will, like, you will be um, a little bit ahead in terms of completing the lab. Before you can show up to the workshop, though, since the lab requires your FPGA, you will need to collect your kit from us, which requires doing all of the three things we just described. And then also installing the software that we use in DAB, uh, Portis Prime ISC and Quest Ascent. The instructions are linked here. If you're on a Windows computer, it's fairly straightforward. Follow this. If you're on a Mac that has an Intel chip, you can follow this. If you're on a Mac that has an ARM core, like an M1 or M2 or whatever, you're kind of out of luck. Good luck. Please team with someone who has a Windows computer. Um, <laughs> Yeah, because we only have a couple of the lab computers. So ideally, have at least one person in your team with Windows or an Intel Mac that you can install Cortis on. But yeah. And then if you use Linux, I don't know how to help you, but probably you know how to help yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so, installing Cortis and Questa has historically been a royal pain in the rear for many, many generations of DAB students. And we would like that to not be the case this year, though it probably will be anyway. So in order to assist you guys with the installation of Cordis and Cuesta, which hopefully you will have done before next Tuesday, we will be terminally online this week, in the sense that we will be available on Discord if you guys need help, or just like, you know, want to chat, whatever. Um, but yeah, our lab hours are Mondays 12 to 6 p.m. and Fridays 10 to 12 p.m. You can pop in the IEEE lab, um, Bolter 2825, at any point during those hours, and we are guaranteed to be there. If you need help at a different time, just message us. We'll work with you to find some time and help you get this stuff sorted out. We want all of you guys to actually be able to start doing the fun stuff and not be stuck installing Cordis and dealing with random Questa licensing issues. So please do this as soon as possible uh, and let us know if you need help before next week's workshop. Anyway, now that all that's done, it is time for the fun part. This actual social, if you will. Yeah. Right, would you like to... So we're going to call this uh, Demonstrate Adventure, aka DAO, and what that entails is uh, it's kind of like a presentation night per se, so we're going to take you up into 14, and you will have a chance to make a presentation for some EC related adventure, and we're asking, please make it stupid because it's meant to be fun and not corporate-like, so we'll split you up into four, as we said before, and you'll get nine minutes to make your presentation and looking now it's splitting you up in four that'll be a big team so this will be fun um, and then your team you can like either try and get everyone to present or send some representatives you have four minutes to wow us with your stupid idea um, and baseline is please entertain us that is the only criteria and we actually do have some incentives for this competition per se and it is um, we're going to hand make your shirts um, by the end of 
by a screen printer. <laughs> These are not going to be crop tops as much as I wish they were. Um, this is just a cropped image of some t-shirts. And so this is the design. And yes, that is the Minecraft font. That was on purpose. But we, hopefully not just me, we will hand make these shirts for you. For your it will, be, it will be this design, though, because yeah. we feel strongly about this particular design. <laughs> anyway. Anything else there? Uh, I think that's it, right? Cool. Uh, your time starts now. Wait. Okay, let's go ahead and do that first, and then your time starts. But let's say um, right down this way. Uh, Hmm, wait, is that enough people? I think it's too many people. Okay, here. well think, here, here. You are on... Divide it on half first and then quarters, right? Sure, that works too. Okay. Yeah. Yes, you can stop the recording. Thank you. Thank you.